Hello, my name is Dr. Jackie Nielsen, and I'm a board-certified veterinary behaviorist. I currently work for Alenco Animal Health, a fear-free sponsor as a regional consult veterinary consultant. Thank you for joining us for the final webinar in the three-part series on the emotional patient experience. We have covered fear-free strategies for two sensory experiences already, touch and smell. If you haven't joined us live for those, please go back and visit www.fearfreepets.com and you can view those. Today we will focus on sight. For those attending the webinar live, you are eligible to receive a half hour of race CE credit for your participation. As we go through the webinar, please type any questions you may have into the questions box on the menu, drop-down menu to the right. There's an arrow, click on that drop-down arrow and type your questions there. Time permitting, we will entertain questions at the end of the half hour. Our goal is to create a tranquil visual experience for our patients and our clients during the veterinary visit. A serene visual experience for both ends of the leash or carrier as it may be, can contribute to the fear-free experience we are striving to achieve. A good place to start in this sensory discovery is to establish an appreciation for the visual capabilities of our feline patients and canine patients as compared to our the human visual capabilities and experiences. If we gain a relative appreciation for what our patients see versus what we see, it should help us in our quest to provide the best possible visual experience for our patients. With that in mind, of the three species here, canine, feline, and human, who do you think is the most sensitive to light? If you answered in your mind to yourself, cats, you are correct. Both cats and dogs are more sensitive to light than humans. Cats are particularly well adapted for nocturnal vision as they have a minimum light detection threshold up to seven times less than that of humans. Other adaptations for nocturnal vision in cats includes a tapetum that reflects up to 130 times more light than the human fundus, a large cornea, which permits more light to enter the eye, a retina dominant dominated by rod photoreceptors, and a form of rhodopsin that continues to increase in sensitivity to light for up to one hour. Dogs have many of these same adaptations, only to a lesser degree, thereby though allowing them to function in both bright and dim light. The cat's visual adaptations are linked to survival, specifically the ability to hunt. In this view you're seeing right now at the beach, cats are able to identify objects in this dim light. And of course, we know cats are actually not nocturnal, but crepuscular in nature, meaning that they are most active at dawn and dusk. This enhanced ability to see in these low light conditions facilitates their ability to secure their next meal. This split image you're seeing on your screen is a simulation of the different visual experiences a human, which is on the top frame, and a cat on the bottom frame would have if they were in the same location in the same lighting conditions. Looking at this, you can really appreciate how much more detail the cat experiences as compared to the human in the low lighting situation. This is another example of the different species visual experiences due, due to differences in visual capabilities. Again, you can appreciate how this enhanced feline sensitivity in low light conditions serves them well in hunting and navigating their environment. 
So while this light sensitivity serves cats well in dim light, in the clinic setting light that is functional for us, it may be especially bright for our patients. Once again, especially the, hu the feline patients. To help alleviate that visual stress on our patients, one fear-free strategy is to dim lighting when and where possible during the veterinary visit. And if we've turned on a brighter surgical type light, for example, in the treatment area to give us better visualization of some part of the body we need on that patient, let's remember to turn off that light as soon as we are done needing it. In some clinics, people have decided when they're perhaps leaving the exam room, so in between our um, periods where we're going back and forth to the exam room to dim or shut off the lights so it's quieter uh, or visually quieter for our patients. And, and that's also a strategy, but make sure that A, you warn your clients you're doing that. And I wouldn't do it if it puts them in complete darkness because that could be a little unnerving for everyone involved and dangerous when we return. So we know that we want these softer lights from a brightness standpoint in our clinic. Visually, I'd like to now explore some differences in sensitivity to motion. Both animals and people are more sensitive to moving objects than stationary ones. In a 1936 study of 14 police dogs, the most sensitive dogs could recognize moving objects at 800 to 900 meters away, but could recognize the same object when stationary only at 585 meters or less. So that motion enhanced their ability to recognize the object. It happens that in bright light, humans are actually 12 times better at detecting motion than our canine and feline counterparts. However, when we consider dim lights, which once again we are striving to achieve in our practices because it is more comfortable for our patient population, that's when our feline patients especially become more adept at seeing motion. So in a dim light, cats and dogs are more attuned to motion and very much so in their peripheral vision. Most dogs and cats ignore stationary objects in their peripheral visual field but reflexively chase them if that same object moves in the periphery. So with that in mind, to accommodate this sensitivity to motion, a fear-free strategy should be to slow down and avoid quick erratic movements. As you move around your workday, try to move efficiently but deliberately when working with our patients. Let's consider visual acuity or how well we see things. The human has the best relative visual acuity of the three species. We have all heard of 2020 vision. That's a person with really great vision. Dogs have, and well, excuse me, but what that means is that a test subject can discern the details of an image, for example, letters on a chart from 20 feet away that a normal person could differentiate from 20 feet away. Of course, if we don't have 2020 vision or weren't blessed with that, we'll often get corrective lenses to achieve that. For our canine population, in general, they have 2075 vision. What that translates into is that from 20 feet away, dogs can distinguish the details of an object that a normal person could see from 75 feet away. And now we transition to the blurriest of species, our feline patients. They have 20 to 200 vision. What a cat can see clearly from 20 feet, you or I could see from 200 feet. This is a uh, two images that depict the rel simulated relative visual acuity between humans depicted on the top frame and the cat 
on the bottom frame. Dogs would fall somewhere in between. What you can appreciate is that our patients are not going to have the same detailed visual discrimination that we enjoy and therefore may not respond the same way to visual stimuli, especially at a distance. The question of color vision. As a child, I remember being told that dogs and cats had no color vision. That was incorrect. Dogs, and to a lesser extent cats, possess and use color vision. Humans have the greatest color spectrum and possess the most color sensitive cone photoreceptors. Research suggests that dogs see a color spectrum similar to humans that suffer from red-green color blindness. What that translates into is that yellow and blue are the colors that dogs and cats are most likely to discriminate and see. How does that play out in our clinical practices? Well, we can perhaps capitalize on this by making items we want our pets to be able to see in colors, blue and yellow, that they will actually appreciate. When I now shop for personal pets, or excuse me, personal toys for my pets, I will look at the option, color options available and select the bulk, bl yellow or blue over perhaps a red or green toy. Again, these fabulous images that um, were created um, by Nicolay Lamb help us to appreciate the differences in the human on the top frame and the cat on the bottom frame of relative color hues that may be seen. On the bottom frame, you can appreciate that the cat is picking out more of the yellow and blue than discriminating between reds and greens. Now that we have considered how they see the world, let's consider who and what they may see during the veterinary visit. Let's start with the white coat effect. This is a phenomena first recognized and documented in human medicine. Human patients exhibited higher blood pressure measurements in the hospital setting when compared with the subject's usual environment, for example, home. While the syndrome was dubbed the white coat effect, it is important to recognize that it is not necessarily a white coat that triggers the response, but instead anything that the subject has associated with the hospital or clinic visit could be that trigger. The subject sees the white coats or has another sensory trigger associated with that medical facility, and that activates their sympathetic nervous system, causing a fight or flight response and associated elevation in blood pressure. Research has been conducted to establish if our veterinary patients also have this white coat effect at the veterinary hospital. 22 greyhounds participated in a study that assessed their blood pressure in three different scenarios. Investigator collecting measurements in the hospital setting, an investigator collecting the measurements in the dog's home environment, and with the owner collecting measurements in the home. The hospital setting resulted in the highest blood pressure and heart rate measurements, suggesting this white coat effect. A study on cats was also conducted to see if they exhibited a white coat effect. I know many of you listening are thinking, well, that's obvious. I can see, I can visually appreciate that they're stressed in the clinic. But this study was a little bit unique because these cats, for other purposes, already had chips microchips implants that were able to measure their blood pressure without any additional handling of the cat. These were research colony cats, so their home was co were colony units inside a research facility. Their blood pressure measurements were captured, once again remotely, as they were living in their home environment of the colony room. They then did a simulated vet visit put the cats in carriers, drove them a distance, and took them into a clinical type setting, very prescribed with a beagle in the waiting room, and then moved them from the waiting room into the exam room and conducted a five-minute examination, simulated exam. 
capturing measurements of their heart rate and blood pressure throughout this remotely. And what they found was that, in fact, their heart rate and blood pressure were increased during veterinary visits. Arrival in the waiting area and the examination, specifically the rectal temperature procedure, resulted in a significant rise in blood pressure. This creates medical and emotional challenges for our veterinary team to navigate. Medically, it may interfere with our ability to accurately diagnose and manage hypertension. Behaviorally, this data confirms that our cats are stressed at the veterinary hospital. Giving cats a quiet space and time to acclimate may help to reduce the white coat effect. We should also try to minimize any negative association learning that increases fear, anxiety, or stress in our patient population. I do like to, to throw in a reminder here that simply taking off white coats is not going to solve the problem. Cats can just as easily develop a light blue coat effect, meaning, or cats or dogs, our patients, could, it could develop that. If they have negative experiences tied to a symbol that they create an associative learning event with, that then will be a trigger moving forward. And we should not forget or minimize the impact on what the owner sees during the visit, since dogs and cats can be very attuned to their human's emotional state and how that owner response may impact their pet. The owner gets stressed, and it travels down the leash or through the carrier handle to that pet. So items that may already have a negative association for the pet, like this rectal thermometer, or that may initiate anxiety in a person should always have a low visual profile in our hospital. What I mean by that is not letting them see it prior to the event. So things that are uncomfortable, try to avoid making the, letting that pet see the item. That said, we're also going to want to employ counter conditioning during anything that is slightly painful or aversive. So distracting that pet with a yummy treat or something that it really likes, catnip, during the procedure that might have slight discomfort associated with it. When we think about injections, we should avoid making a big production of drawing up an injection and tapping out any air bubbles. Because once again, that not only may affect the pet if it starts to make a correlation between I see that and then I feel a needle poke, but certainly many owners could get nervous watching that preparation of the injection. So as that pet or dog may get anxious, cat or dog may get anxious, the owner's anxiety may also become increased for that impending injection to their beloved pet. For vaccines, the most frequent injection we give in most general practices, another strategy is to use the highly purified ultra-reduced volume vaccine. Not only may the lower volume be associated with a more comfortable vaccine experience for the pet, but seeing the smaller volume may relieve some stress for owners. Alenco is the first and only company to offer canine and feline highly purified low volume one half ml vaccines for a fear-free vaccine experience. Minimizing the number of injections by using combination vaccines when appropriate is another fear-free strategy. For example, if a dog is due for its Lyme and Lepto booster, instead of having two separate syringes with one ml of liquid in each one to inject, then poking the pet twice. Instead, use the ultra duramune combination Lyme and Lepto vaccine for that booster. That ultra combination vaccine will provide the full protection against those pathogens with a single poke and a smaller volume. In addition to minimizing exposure to those inanimate objects that may evoke some fear, anxiety, or stress in our patients, we need to identify and minimize other visual stress triggers. This photo captures a scenario that is all too common in veterinary hospitals, 
a dog approaching a cat inside a carrier. It's hard for, even to imagine how terrifying that must be for a cat. We don't have to imagine it. This study tells us that exposure to dogs is very stressful to cats. 120 cats were evaluated in four different shelters, and the greatest factor that increased cat stress level scores in shelters was exposure to dogs. Separating species at your clinic should be a priority. However, if species segregation is not possible due to architectural limitations, there are other strategies that can help. This study looked at the provision of a box for stress reduction in shelter cats. 10 cats were provided with a box in their kennel and nine cats did not get a box. The cats that had access to the box, essentially a visual blockade or hiding spot, had lower stress scores than did cats without that provision. While provision of a box may not always be feasible, once again due to space constraints, a towel or fleece draped over a carrier or over the head of a pet is usually feasible and can mimic that box effect by creating a visual barrier. As you can see on this display, you can use that container holding your towels or fleeces to also communicate your fear-free efforts to your clients. In this case, they used it as a way to also discuss the, the clinic's adoption of the ultra-purified half ML vaccines. The final consideration I want to talk about today are something I call sight lines. What do our patients see from their perspective, which is often several feet lower than our sight line? Paying attention to their sight line can help us to identify visual barriers that may make them balk or become anxious. If you don't have a clear line of sight, it can really escalate anxiety and fear because you might be nervous about what's on the other side of that barrier. Pets that are coming into our clinics already a little nervous or anxious may resist walking towards a visual dead end. I like to think about this a couple of ways. If you were scared of spiders, let's say, Halloween's coming up, so let's, if any of you have a fear of spiders, and we were in a room and we dropped the room with maybe a little closet off it, so a little clove, if you will, and we drop some spiders on the floor, and there's a, and a clove closet and an, a door, an open door that goes to the rest of the building, where would you run? The likely, some of you would faint, but the rest of you would likely run, most of us would likely run to the open space um, with the ability to, our sympathetic nervous system is coming in to escape from that threat that we've perceived. In many practices, when I walk in, I see one of the first things that we do, especially for dogs, is to try to get them on a scale. And unfortunately, that scale is often in a clove or at least in a corner, which to a pet is a dead end for them. And so we end up struggling to get the pet on the scale. That starts that decline in their level of comfort for the visit or increasing their stress, fear, and anxiety, things we don't want to do. So being very cognizant of dead ends in your clinic and trying to avoid them, moving that scale to an area where that pet can have a clear sight line. Or even when you're turning around corners, we might be able to see over, for example, a reception desk, but that pet doesn't know what's on the other side. So giving a wide berth so they can they're acclimate to see what's coming if you are trying to get them behind a, a barrier, a visual barrier, a dead end. In summary, I just want to give you some take home messages here that we could do for our, our patient population and, and, and giving them the most tranquil visual experience possible. First is dim the lights when possible. If you have bulbs, trying to have 60 watt bulbs or nothing greater than that, I should say, in your facility. Be deliberate, move slowly. For distinguish, let's look for yellow and blue items. And then separating our species, if we can, once again, having cats and dogs separated, and if not, helping the cats have a way to disappear, and that could be through the use of boxes or perhaps even using a, just a visual barrier like a towel or fleece. 
Leaving you there, let's once again, please visit the Fear Free website to see other webinars. I'm going to turn it over, Mary, to see if there's any questions that have come in that we should be, can answer before we tie up today's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen. Um, at this time, I do not see any questions. Just a reminder to attendees, if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, there should be a little box that says questions. Um, please feel free to type anything into that box. Oh, I did see that we had some challenges here with the webinar not starting until 9.35. I missed a few minutes. Um, th did I talk about the visual capabilities in the first few minutes before cats? Did I talk about the dogs? I did talk about dogs in looking at, so let's see where maybe you, if we missed something at the beginning there where we came on, that would have been considering that brightness consideration. And dogs usually fall somewhere between cats and humans. So they're in the middle, if we will, between those two. So from a brightness perspective, they have greater capability than humans to see in dim light, but they're not nearly as adept at picking up visual cues and dim lights as cats are. And then also for the, for the motion, Cats are very good in dim light at detecting motion. Dogs, once again, better than humans in dim light, but not quite um, as good as cats. Let's see if there's anything else that came in. I am not seeing any questions on my end, Dr. Nielsen. Okay, I'm gonna look at the chat section and see. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Well, with that, I will ask that if you haven't had a chance yet to go to www.fearfreepets.com, please do visit the site if you would like to review other webinars. And just another little pitch, I will be doing another webinar, and that will be on a live webinar on October 24th. 2019 focusing on six client tips for successful puppy socialization. So thanks again and have a great day.